So the official chapter translations dropped and there were actually more changes in chapter 1040 than I originally expected. Now I'm kind of wondering how some things were even translated previously because they were some wonky additions that definitely changed the meaning of things and changed my perspective. But anyways, here we are for chapter 1040's deep analysis part 1 focused on 4th hockey. If you're new to my channel, the way I view the world is by making connections. So let me connect you to my vision, the par vision. So first things first, the chapter title. So originally it was falling on deaf ears and I thought that was really fitting because you know Big Mom was falling and couldn't make a sound and was pretty desperate and she couldn't call out to her homies. So I thought that title made a lot of sense but then the official title ends up being wasted words on young ears. And so now it's more meaning that words that Big Mom was saying to Kid and Law and that they kind of just straight up ignored her to the point where Law just silenced her. I think Kid's dialogue in the chapter was the main counter to Big Mom where he said, why should we be afraid of the weak words of some old hag who has outlived her welcome? Basically the title coming to fruition there with how Big Mom's threat was wasted on these young Yonko candidates, which is a great segue into the whole threat thing that Big Mom said. In the unofficial translations, there was a specific line here that said kids' attacks were tickling her, but the Viz translations show barely any of that sentiment and the only part that resonates with that is Big Mom saying she will deflect his attack back, which that dialogue makes so much more sense. In my first read, I was genuinely confused because I was the one expecting the railgun three months ago, and I was the one that said the railgun would be the strongest output kids should demonstrate right now. So for her to say that almost felt like a slap into my own analysis. So I'm low-key glad that this is how it was translated, and now the fight progression makes way more sense with how Kid maintained the blast throughout it because if he had stopped then Big Mom would automatically have the upper hand. So a lot of you said that she probably said that it was tickling to further antagonize and threaten them to act as a scare tactic that would prepare them for her soul pocus. I think a lot of you were more right in capturing the overall sentiment there despite that line just being translated wildly different. I honestly didn't think this was the part of the chapter that would be affected by the new translations, and now I have a better respect for the Viz translations. Though I feel at the end of the day, the Viz translations also sometimes feel wonky, I've been having a greater sense of security in the meaning when Viz translates it, which sounds obvious, but it was to the point that some of you may have seen I was actively looking for the raw chapters and also a source to help me understand the chapter better as Oda wrote it rather than the possible degree of missed meaning that naturally comes from any kind of translational conversion. That being the case, I found two sources so far. There was a particular user on Reddit that seems to do really good analysis on the translations. I shared that in my Discord. But also with this chapter, Jasser on Twitter highlighted that the unofficial translations might have missed the mark on the ending words Big Mom said about the One Piece being in Wano. And it looked like Viz did a better job of bringing that accuracy in the detail there. Which brings me to my macro organizational point. As I mentioned previously, I stay away from the spoilers because it feels like it creates this false sense of the chapter that can be wildly different than what is the case, which also screws up my videos. But also, I may change how I interact with the first read videos versus the deep analysis videos because it feels so much better to put my two cents after getting the official translations, which I noted in the last video. So as I mentioned in my last video, I wanted to save the Big Mom monologue for when the official translations drop, but I left a note about that at the end of the video, and as I mentioned at the start of this video, I want to run through some of the major minor things that I honestly didn't pay attention to as much because I was excited about my theory that I dropped at the end of the last video about how the three ancient weapons were just the epithets of Joy Boy's commanders in his pirate crew. But without diving further there, watch my first read reaction to get the gist of it, and the video on ancient weapons will just have to be a separate thing all on its own that I'll have to make in the future. So the first detail that I overlooked that I want to get out of the way, it seems that my chapter 1038 reaction was right. First, the Grim Reaper was definitely not Brook as I thought. He is shown in a completely different area with Robin as I said he would be. Glad to see the good old par vision intuition is still working. Also I said the Grim Reaper that Zoro would face would leave him in a pool of his own blood. I'm not sure if the 500 chapter parallel is completed with this, but that part lines up. It looks like Zoro was damaged in some sense, and now because of the explosion, Zoro is now falling off of Onigashima. And that also lines up with the fact that I said Zoro is going to need a rescue here, and yes, there's many people that are possible to be that rescue for him, but unless I'm wrong, I don't think we've seen Sanji yet. And Sanji's a peak observational hockey user who can fly, and has been constantly connecting back with Zoro throughout this Onigashima 
Yashima War. So if that trend continues, then it might be Sanji who saves Zoro here. Which again would be really ironic since Zoro told Sanji not to die. Meanwhile, Zoro is the one basically dying. Anyways, I really liked that chapter 1038 video. My part vision there was really solid. So the second detail that I overlooked was this panel, where I think this kind of clarifies a lot of things. It was weird because it felt like, at least in the manga panels, Big Mom was not using Conqueror's Hockey as much as it felt like we should have expected, though I do think it makes some sense because I was saying before it seems like Big Mom and Kaido use Conqueror's Hockey differently. They both use it for offense, and Big Mom's is a little interesting, but Kaido uses a lot for his physical attacks, whereas Big Mom has been using a lot more energy attacks based off of her homies. So I don't think she can imbue those with Conqueror's Hockey, but also Kid and Law both are using attacks that kind of bypass Conqueror's Hockey in a really unique way. That being said, from my memory, this looks like Big Mom used Conqueror's Hockey to defend against Kid's Railgun Projectile, and I think this might be the first concrete display of Conqueror's Hockey used defensively. So this black lightning from Conqueror's Hockey is most likely clashing with the lightning and energy coming off of Kid's attack. So Kid's attack is directly combating Big Mom's defense, something I don't think we've ever seen pierced. I don't think Big Mom's defense source was ever explained, it was just demonstrated to be absolutely absurd. And Kaido's defense is from his devil fruit, because dragon scales are incredibly thick. Law's attacks that affected Big Mom have all been internal, and function by bypassing all forms of armor regardless of its source. Kid's attacks, though, have all been confronting Big Mom's insane durability head on, which is why I was saying and questioning whether Kid's way of attacking Big Mom would ever really damage her, because we saw examples play out with Luffy where he could not damage Kaido or bypass Kaido's defense without using Conquer Imbuement himself, which brings me to a really interesting point. I never really thought of this, and I might have brought it up had I started my chapter analysis back then when chapter 1009 came out, but so when we look at the first time Kaido dodges Luffy, it's here in this panel. Luffy uses what is probably Red Rock or Red Hawk. We are unsure because Luffy actually doesn't finish the attack because Kaido dodges it. And he dodged this attack because he knew it was going to hurt him. And this is before Luffy learned Conqueror's Hockey Imbuement. Yes, Luffy was learning Ryo, and it seemed like on chapter 1000, when he hit Kaido with Red Rock, it's shown to actually damage him. It's hard to tell from this collision, but this is before Luffy realizes he can imbue his attack with Conqueror's, as he learned of this in chapter 1010. So Kaido is dodging a Ryo attack, which I want to ask you guys, in the manga, there's no real indication of Ryo, is there? I remember on chapter 955, Luffy used Ryo against the tree, and there's not really anything to indicate the Ryo. And so what's interesting here is that there seems to be a difference with Ryo and Conqueror's hockey attacks, which is obvious, but then there's also a difference with elemental hockey attacks too. So if we look at all three of these panels, there's one with Luffy using Gear 4 King Kong Gun. So this is arguably his strongest attack. Then there's this panel where Luffy hits Kaido with Red Rock, which is on fire. And he's not in Gear 4, so it's weaker in terms of damage than the last one. And then we have this panel where Luffy hits Kaido with a Conqueror Hockey Punch, which looks like to be a normal punch. If we can assume that all three attacks use Ryo as a base way to reach and damage Kaido, then it seems like this is the order of damage, where just Ryo is the weakest despite Luffy using his strongest form. Ryo plus what I call elemental hockey damaged Kaido significantly more despite not being in gear 4, and Conqueror's hockey infused with Ryo with no elemental hockey did the most damage despite being the weakest base punch. So then you can use that to put into context the amount of damage Luffy is doing thereafter, when he learns Conqueror's hockey infused Ryo and is attacking with his stronger forms and with his fire attacks, or what I call elemental hockey. They definitely provide multipliers to his attacks, and I'm saying this because we know Kaido is durable to fire. He withstood his own Boro breath that Raizo redirected with little to no damage it seemed. Yes, he was burnt and damaged, but in terms of fire attacks, it's his own. So so unless Luffy's red rock contains more heat and fire than his literal fire breath, then this is really interesting. It makes it feel like my elemental hockey theory is supported here, in the sense that the fire created by Luffy is some extension of hockey.
Rocky, which is why it provides an extra boost of damage over base Ryo and can damage Kaido, despite him being so durable. It seems like energy-based attacks and energy conversion attacks are attacks that can end up equating to similar damage as Conqueror Haki infused attacks, meaning that it's plausible that the next power horizon might be elemental. So if you haven't seen my elemental hockey fourth hockey theory, check them out. They are my earlier videos, but I insert details of those videos throughout all of my videos and expand the most on it in my Sanji video, adding the thematic of emotions that Oda seems to have a really heavy focus on, especially since he was going to direct a whole movie about emotions called Crystal Ship Log. That being said, my future videos will also contain that and will have another inflection point when I put out my Brook video. So all of that being said, you may be asking yourself, Parvision, why are you bringing up all of this stuff in the chapter 1040 chapter analysis? Well, some of you already messaged me about this, but some of these things that happen in this chapter are literally things I said could be possible in my elemental hockey video, and specifically my observation hockey video. If you're new to my channel and you feel like me talking about past videos are like some self-promo plug, it's not. My channel is literally set up where all my videos connect, and my chapter reactions are the most removed from my theories, but I like to bring them up when some of my theories get connected back to recent chapters. So okay though, what are examples from this chapter? First of all, let's talk about this. I literally have a video where I said devil fruit attacks can be recreated through hockey or naturally. Though this example stretches it a tiny bit, it's a devil fruit attack being recreated by another devil fruit through currently unknown means. We don't know how awakenings fully work. Is it tied to conquerors hockey? But so far only law hasn't shown conqueror hockey of the awakening users. But in general, the main contingency on devil fruit awakenings seem to be the experience of fruit and knowledge of the power. But let me ask you something. Did Law using Re-Room not remind you of how Luffy used Red Hawk? The setup, the feeling, it kind of felt similar, did it not? Where yes, Luffy in addition to his Devil Fruit is somehow manifesting Ace's Fire Fist, though in a weaker form. As we talked about it before, it doesn't seem to be a normal fire, as Luffy's fire seems to be comparable if not stronger than Kaido's own Boro Breath. So does that mean Law's Reroom could be an elemental hockey type of attack that is conjoined with his Devil Fruit ability? And this goes back to willpower, where the idea that in One Piece, with the right experiences and the right amount of willpower, anything is possible. And it might be that, because of Law's experiences with Rosinante, like Luffy's experience with Ace, Law has willed his ability to demonstrate another Devil Fruit's ability. And so this was part of my chapter 1039 video that I scrapped, and I can't help thinking that Law has demonstrated elemental hockey, and you probably know where I'm going with this. But okay, clearly Oda is a gamer, because he named Law's fruit the OP OP fruit, which is hilarious because it's actually one of the most broken and OP fruits in the entire show. Can we just run down some of the things that it can do? So anything within Law's room is kind of an operation room. He can manipulate anything within it, dissect and cut things, swap them and move them, he can take certain things out of people like poisons and drugs, and then the awakened K room allows him to apply his room to an object, and that object is able to phase through anything, with no resistance, and apply various effects throughout where the object has phased through. And then there's Reroom, which we already talked about, but something I haven't mentioned, and some of you may be on the trail here for this, so far, all of Law's moves attributed to his Devil Fruit are spatial manipulation related. From Room to Kroom to Reroom, it's all about Law creating a space in an area of effect where Law can create the Laws within that room. I'm waiting for that moment to see another version of a room, and I surmise there might be a Dark Room, where Law is able to block light and it would appear dark within the bubble but act as a pure mirror outside of the room. For the time being, until it appears, I'm just going to call that the D room. But okay, so there's one thing that I've dodged talking about with Law that kind of feels like the odd ability out of the rest. So yes, I know there are defibrillators in a medical setting, but isn't Law's electric abilities kind of random? What if that wasn't a part of his devil fruit? What if that was actually elemental hockey? And I know you're gonna say, yeah, the whole medical thing. And the thing is, let's look at the gamma knife. Cause that seemed to be when he emphasized his electric prowess in his moveset. And the thing about it is one, a gamma knife doesn't use electricity. Well, it does, but it's not like a real gamma knife just shocks you. It's in the name. A gamma knife uses radiation. And I always thought this naming was weird. And on top of that, Oda would probably know this. And Law as a doctor would know this too. 
But it might just be a cool name that Law uses, so I never really brought it up seriously before. And so his gamma knife that's supposed to use radiation uses electricity. And what was crazy was that if you watch my Sanji and Shiki videos, I was saying how passions and emotions are tied to the elemental abilities, and how wonder might be wind, and I said desire is probably electricity. And I have so many connections lined up for my future Conquers Hockey video that makes electricity make so much sense. But so to summarize what I said before, when people display Play peak desire, they will manifest lightning. And so let's look at the chapter title when Law used Gamma Knife and Countershock. It's literally called Desire, which is one of the core passions attributed to emotions by famous French philosopher Rene Descartes. And again, if you're new and don't know the context of what I'm talking about, go watch my Sanji series. So all of that to say, I think at the minimum in the last few chapters, we were treated to some really interesting displays of power, and I will continually review them because sure, my theory could be completely wrong, but even then, I said we'd probably be seeing these exact powers displayed in the near future by someone other than the relative devil fruit power holder. I even said that com com fruit specifically would be recreated in the near future in my observation hockey video. And so another thing that Law showed that demonstrates some sort of elemental hockey prowess, or maybe even soul manipulation, is that Law, without his room, managed to cut Big Mom's misery flame attack in half. He throws re-room on Big Mom, and it doesn't show him using room again, but still uses what seems to be akin to flame rend that both Zoro and Kinyamon show, so that is definitely some sort of energy manipulation and possible elemental hockey being displayed. And now, okay, before touching back on Big Mom, cause she demonstrated something really interesting also, but let's start with Kid. So I have less to say about Kid cause I think he will require a full video, but so if I'm saying elemental hockey is gonna be the next frontier of power and the current one is Conqueror's hockey, it's really fitting to what we saw a direct clash of something like that, where it might be that Kid clash with elemental hockey type of power against what seemed to be a Conqueror hockey defense. And I know you're probably saying, so wait, what? Kid used a railgun, not elemental hockey. Yes, that is true, but I always said Oda chose these powers for these three captains specifically. Luffy is essentially an energy resistor. Energy shouldn't permeate well through him or against him since he is a base insulator. Kid is essentially the opposite in the sense that he isn't the conductor himself, but his power allows him to conduct energy to his will. Magnetic fields manipulate energy of all kinds. And the fact that we see an example of where Kid doesn't seem to have used any Conqueror's hockey, but was able to overcome Conqueror hockey with magnetism tells me one or two things. The first thing being that I think Oda chose magnetism because it plays a really powerful role in elemental hockey. And two, that the hockey that we have come to know may be based on elements themselves, as I mentioned in my original elemental hockey video. Though I had more of a hypothesis, less so than a theory, it's hard to say but I'm definitely gathering more and more information as we keep on getting it. So now touching on Big Mom. Did anyone realize this before, how important Big Mom's voice was to her power? She has to instill fear into people, usually by speaking, to take souls in the first place. But thereafter, in order to communicate to her homies, she also has to speak. That really tells me that her speech might have varying degrees of conquerors imbued in it. We see it specifically with Zeus and some of the other homies that retaliate. They are able to disobey her without her presence or direct orders. Then in the presence of a Vivre card, they panic, but some are still able to disobey. But it's weird with Zeus, who has betrayed Big Mom essentially, but I would have thought that Big Mom could have telepathically or mentally controlled her homies too. But I guess that doesn't make sense. I just want to point out this because, well, with Zunisha back and then we see how powerful voices can be, Shirahoshi is literally considered an ancient weapon because of her voice. So then Law's Reroom and Rosinante's Com Com Fruits are technically hard counters to Poseidon, right? But I think again, it's important to note the very various powers of voices demonstrated by One Piece. And okay, I know I said I was going to talk about Big Mom's monologue in this video, but I don't want to bury it this far into a video, so I'm either going to post a separate video this week on dissecting that, or wait until the new chapter to dive into it. I have a feeling that we'll learn more about Wano's importance and possibly Roger too. The reason why is because this is the first time I think Odin's journal has been brought back up, and that journal is literally every theorist's holy grail. If we get more info from that journal, then that opens up so much lore and back background. So if the lights get switched on soon, it might be more fun just to wait a little longer rather than shoot in the dark.
So before I end the video, the one other clarification I wanted to make, because last video I talked so much about Zunisha and the ancient weapons, and so something that I wanted to emphasize was that the crime that Zunisha committed feels more so that the crime is based off of a promise rather than an actual crime, like murder or something. On top of that, Zunisha's crime might be a self-imposed punishment. It could be that Zunisha feels so guilty for breaking the promise or wronging Joy Boy, or possibly Poseidon also. This crime is something that Zunisha has determined as a crime. Crime, which would put Zunisha more akin to Laboon if Laboon left his promised waiting spot and then felt guilty about breaking that promise with the Rumbar pirates. Or Zunisha could have accidentally destroyed something he shouldn't have using his theorized Pluton powers. So anyways, if you guys thought that this was interesting, please let me know in the comments. These chapters keep on showing us some crazy things. Like it really feels like we're getting towards the last phase of One Piece, the final frontier. And I'm not sure how long the journey will be, but I'm glad you guys have joined me on this journey. Also, special shout out to the person who I think ordered five Parvision tank tops. That's so dope. As always, thank you all for connecting with me, and I'm looking forward to connecting with you all on the next Parvision.